What's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of The Rock Your Brand podcast. And we are going to be talking about something today that, whoa, hey, whoa, Chris, is that me or you? That might be me. I think it's me. That just threw me off like crazy threw me off. Sorry about that, guys. I must have had it up in the behind the screen here on the YouTube channel when I was given that link. Oh, that was kind of crazy. Maybe we should start that again, Chris, just so we have a cleaner edit on the front end of this. <laughs> What's and up, guys? Welcome go. back to <laughs> another episode of the Rock Your Brand podcast. Today, we are going to be talking about something that I have been somewhat obsessed with over the last, I would say, seven, eight months, but lately, super obsessed. And I am going to talk about how. I actually had a conversation with a friend of mine, how he is going to, and anyone really can build a side hustle and turn it into a six figure micro brand as we're calling it. And the reason why I'm calling it a micro brand is because, well, it's a brand that you can build without having any employees. It could be very small. It could be a one person uh, gig. And uh, that's what I'm going to be going over. Chris and I are going to be talking through what this strategy really looks like and what it is that I've been super obsessed about. So Chris, I know you're excited about this topic as I am. Are you ready to officially get this thing rocking and rolling? I'm ready to rock some micro brands, if you will. And Scott, you know, it's funny, every time you and I bring up the word brand, people are like, well, I'm not a brand. I'm a one person shop or I run an Etsy business or whatever. And you and I have been trying to tackle that mindset for a while now. Because if you are just an Etsy store or an Amazon shop or a YouTube channel or a blogger, then you're kind of missing the long-term benefits of doing just a few of the basic things that we're going to be talking about that really help you secure that into long-term sustainable revenue, which is the real reason that most people, at least based on the, the conversations we've had with people, start the side hustle to begin with is either to replace their nine to five or to give them long-term sustainable income in retirement right? Yes, it might start off to earn an extra couple hundred bucks to pay some medical bills. But the real long term benefit and the real long term want of people is to have that be income that continues. And so if you can focus on getting the idea of like, the only thing that is a brand is someone that has 50, 100, 5000 employees, makes sneakers in 50 countries around the world or whatever, then you can start to figure out how this fits with what it is that you're doing. So what we're gonna be laying out today is the roadmap that we suggest that people follow if they're looking to turn something that they're doing as a side hustle into that long-term sustainable income as a micro brand. And if you wanna add more employees into this, you can, but the whole point of this is that you can do this with as small of a team as possible. And starting off, Scott, like with what you said, yeah, probably just you, but potentially adding in one or two part-time people or contractors to help you with some of the things you're not as good at or don't like, you don't have to hire 50 full-time employees to start to scale this thing up. Yeah. Let me first say this. The reason, one of the reasons why I wanted to do this live and put it out there into the, you know, the, uh, the web sphere, is that what we would call it? Like the, the internet, but like out there, so everyone can benefit from this thing, whatever it is, right? What I wanted to do is have this conversation because I know that a lot of people are starting on, let's call it Etsy, because that's a lot of my audience right now, Amazon, whatever, right? They're starting on a platform and a lot of the, you know, the online gurus out there are basically, they're missing one important thing that they're not telling people and they're not saying, and I don't know that they're, I don't think that they're doing it because they don't want people to know. I just think that they're not thinking along the lines of, okay, are we building a business or are we just trying to find a way to make money? Right. There, there's a difference. And the big difference is because I was just having this conversation with a gentleman that has done very well on Etsy, over $2 million in Etsy. And one of those was, you know, like selling masks, like when we were in that thing. I'm not going to say it because the, you know, the video will probably, you know, could get hurt because they don't like us saying that word for whatever reason. But the thing that allowed people to have to stay home or, you know, made people stay home um, and was selling masks. 
and did really well, but then had to readjust and figure out a way that was going to find other products that people would buy. And my question was, okay, what happens now if Etsy doesn't let you sell on their platform anymore? What are you going to do? You got any customer data? Well, you can pull customer data from any of these platforms, which is great, but are you? And are they related to what they purchased? Right? So that was the big thing for me. It's like, there's not enough people in this space, in the make money space online about really how to build a, a brand and do it as, as a side hustle. Because I think everyone, when they're starting, they don't want to think about building this big thing. They want to start with a side hustle, which I'm a huge fan of, but there's also some, some strategy behind that, that I think needs to be considered. And I was actually having a, a beer with one of my buddies the other day talking about this thing that I'm pretty obsessed about. And, uh, well, I'll just spit it out. It's YouTube. And if you're watching this on YouTube right now, well, thank you. And, uh, the reason why I'm so obsessed with it is because I've been, a, a lot of you don't know, I have been on YouTube publishing on YouTube on and off for over 14 years. My first video was uploaded 14 years ago. And I'll talk a little bit about uh, like why I did it, what happened from that. I mean, built multiple businesses from doing that uh, and why I decided to recently start focusing more on YouTube because back then, back in the old days, and even I would say a year and a half, two years ago, everyone, including myself, was thinking, okay, YouTube is a search engine. But now there's more opportunity, and I feel like it's it's the way it was back then for people that don't understand how to use it. There's a lot more opportunity to using YouTube. And now before you go running off and saying, well, I don't want to do YouTube, I just want to, you know, be behind the computer and whatever, like just just hear me out, right? And we'll we'll kind of go through this and I'll give you guys the plan that I went over with my buddy having that beer, and he's already, you know, been creating uh actually he's on his third video he's going to be uploading here this week uh and his first or his uh second video that he uploaded is over 1800 views right now uh in over in, i think it was like four or five days ago so it's definitely definitely i, I don't want to say the wild wild west now because there's a lot of things that we can do that you couldn't do before because youtube was all about search it still is but not nearly as much and there's a whole different approach that we're using in an entire micro brand can be built from using this traffic source. So that's really what I'm obsessed about. Chris and I, I mean, every day we're going back and forth with like video ideas or uh, a new strategy that we're going to test or things with the thumbnails and all of these different things that we are, that we're trying to learn and, and leveraging the power of YouTube. And Another little side story here, and I'll, we're going to get started here, but Chris and I, we actually did away with paid ads. We used to do a lot of money in a lot of money, like thousands of dollars per month in paid ads for our brand, brand creators. And we ended up shutting them all off over nine months ago. And we've grown our subscribers on YouTube and our email list, and we've gotten over 2 million views on YouTube across our videos since we've been focusing on this we, we've had more in the past but two million in the last since uh, what January 1st I, I did the numbers last night so yeah that's what I'm obsessed about right now and I just want to tell everyone about it that will listen like this is a huge a huge opportunity and that's really what we're going to be talking about here today and giving you that plan that I gave my buddy sitting uh you know having that beer the other night uh, in one of our local breweries. So Chris, I know that was a little long winded there, but I got a lot to share here. It's all good, man. And I think here's the deal, right? You and I actually had a, a long conversation and we touched on this a little bit in the last episode of the podcast. If you guys are listening to this, if you were watching this with us on YouTube, it's the last live video that we did, I believe. Uh, it was from last week. So just go back and find that. But <clears throat> about two weeks ago now, I guess at this point, we were at one of our favorite places to go every year, Seller Summit's e-commerce conference that happens in Fort Lauderdale, usually. <laughs> Fort Lauderdale, Miami, depends on the year, but usually in Fort Lauderdale every year in May. And it's sponsored by our buddy Steve Chu, put on by him and his team, who do a great job. But we had a lot of conversations there with people, Scott, about 
the way that content plays a role in the e-commerce world. And it turns out that they make a lot of the same mistakes. And one of the conversations that we had over and over again with people is the, the long conversation that you and I had after, after my session with one of the people who was there, who said, you know, I, I don't want to be in front of the camera. And that's okay, right? There are some circumstances where a YouTube channel doesn't make sense. But as long as you're not thinking that the camera is going to steer, steal your soul, right? So like 99.999% of cases, YouTube is probably going to be the place to start. You can do this in a written blog format. You can do this in other ways. But the upside of something like video-based content, especially on a platform like YouTube, is the evergreen nature and the ever-growing potential reach. And Scott, you touched on something a few minutes ago. You said YouTube is no longer a search engine. And they're still the second biggest search engine. Yeah, but and this is a big, big, huge, but, right? Yeah. I need hammer pants for this. Yeah, yeah. Um, eighty percent of the traffic is coming from suggested and recommendations. 70, 75 to eighty percent, depending on who you ask. The other twenty percent is coming from subscription notifications, search, and basically everything else inside of the YouTube platform. So yes, search still plays a role, and there's still millions of people uh, a day searching things on YouTube, but. The game of having to have a ton of subscribers for any, you know, to, to ever get the chance of having someone see your content is out the window. And I think you were just talking about your friend who put up his second video last week, and it was the first video he's put up in quite a while. He doesn't ha really have a subscriber base, and it's already gotten, what did you say, 1,800 views? Yeah, like, I, th I think it's 1,900 now. Almost 2,000 views in less than a week, because I think he put it up Thursday afternoon, if I'm remembering quick correctly uh and actually so, it th i think it was friday he was supposed to <laughs> he was supposed okay, to publish it on wednesday and then he said thursday and then things happened and then he finally got it up friday so now his new posting date is fridays and uh yeah that's that's when it was so yeah last friday. and so that's that's without having all of the subscribers having all of these things nope. as long as you're doing the rest of this process correctly youtube rewards you with traffic which in the case of youtube is counted as views right mm -hmm. and so if if you can take advantage of that as a platform, and yes, you can include all of the other platforms, you can include Rumble, you can include anything else that you want that hosts video content. But if you're doing that, it gives you a massive leg up. You can always turn this back into written content. And there are some circumstances where written content first makes more sense, but you don't have to worry about that. Just pick one or the other. And like, like I said, 99.999% of the time, Right now, I would be recommending that people start with video. There's nothing wrong with having website content. We have website content. And for what we're doing, you know, in addition to the, the leads that we're getting from YouTube, it brings in a substantial number of, of leads and sales to the brand creator's business. But there's not the same level of opportunity that there is on YouTube. And what you'll notice, Scott, and if you guys haven't noticed, technically, uh, this video, this podcast, this channel falls into the make money online niche, right? Like I hate that because there's, it's such a broad niche, but that's really like the, the side of the world that YouTube views us as. So this is a lot more competitive than going after regular niches. And we're seeing this over and over again, Scott, you and I, um, just in the last week between the three of us, we launched, I think three video, we help people launch three different videos on different channels. And they're all well over 1500 views within the first week, having not done this before, having not played with these things. I know that that's not like world changing numbers, right? But think about that in less than a week on essentially new places, people, 1500 people have seen something that they have done. Some of them have come back and subscribed. They're all waiting for more content, already asking in the comments for more content. And if that's the first video that you put up, what happens when you start to give them other things that they can consume? And you, it becomes very easy to see how big this snowball can grow and how quickly this snowball can grow. And I think that's part of the reason you and I are so pumped up about YouTube. Yeah. Okay. So I know that was a long intro to what we're going to be talking about, but I wanted to give you guys like the overall like view of what we're talking about. Now, we're not saying build your business on YouTube. That's not what we're saying. What we are saying is, is like a traffic source an organic traffic source that can happen very, very quickly. Like if you're writing content, like we've talked about this, we have content sites, we have brand creators, which is a content site. We have uh, other uh, little micro niche properties, as we call them, that are generating, uh, you know, revenue on a regular basis, actually uh, monthly. And those are all content like words on 
you know, on the, on the screen, on paper, like on the web, right? Like it's, it's basically words, right? And they're being found by Google. That takes time. It can take up to three, four, six months to get something ranked. What I'm saying is, is like, you can go into a brand new niche and post a video doing not search-based content, but actually, and we'll talk about it, like creating content that is going to get clicks. And what's going to happen is YouTube is going to show that to people that they think would be interested by looking at things like your title, things like your description, and also what your channel starts to be known for. Very similar to if you are on Etsy and you are publishing a lot on the pet industry, well, you're going to start ranking for pet stuff before someone else that's brand new, right? You're starting to train the algorithm of who you are serving, and then they're going to find the audiences for you versus the other way it was years ago. And it still is search you know, on YouTube, but the way it used to be is, is you'd have to go find titles, right? Search queries that were being searched for, just like you do for a blog post right now. We don't need to worry about that anymore. We can have a thousand views, 1500 views, 10,000 views in two days, three days, five days, sometimes when we are creating our video around a topic that potentially get, get shown to these other audiences. And that's exactly what happened. Like Chris was saying with someone he's working with someone I'm working with. Um, and we're working with these people, by the way, like the guy that I'm working with, he's a friend of mine and I've been on him for probably two years to do this. And he put up one video about a year ago and it had 111 views on it. Right. And I think he had like four subscribers. Well, now he posted after we talked about this the other day with the newer strategy, not going after search. Right. And, uh, the first day, I think he might've had like 50 views, something like that. But then two days later, maybe a day and a half, boom, it started ticking up because now they're using AI. YouTube is using AI to kind of find those audience in those pockets and it's doing testing against those. And I'm not going to get into all, all the nitty gritty, but that's what I'm geeking out about is like that type of stuff because there's no limit on how much traffic we can get. And if we get the traffic, then we can monetize. We can monetize it on YouTube. We can monetize with our own products, with affiliate products, like all that stuff. So I'm going to walk you guys through with that what that plan looked like for, you know, my, my friend, we can talk about it. I would be curious, uh, right now on this, this live stream, if you guys would do me a favor in the comments, how many people right now are thinking about, or would want to generate free traffic in the thousands from YouTube. So just drop that in the comments. I'd love to know. All right. Um, so Chris, let's, let's just kind of, uh, let, let's lay this out. And I, I did want to share that story about how I started, what, 14 years ago, uploading my first video and how that ended up um, kind of getting me interested in YouTube. But then I kind of fell off the wagon. And the reason why was because it was all search based. And then we, so we can tell that story too. Chris, what direction you want to go here? I've got a bunch of different areas we can cover, but I know that we have like four or five different things that we can go over as far as like the steps on what we would do. And what we are currently doing. Yeah, let's just start. Let's let's lay out the roadmap for everybody. And as sure. we talk our way through that, we'll see kind of how much time we have and all of those kinds of things. Cool. Yeah. Okay. So the very first thing is you need to, just like I've always said, we need to look at the niche that we are going after. All right. So the very, very, very first thing that we need to do is we need to go, okay, what niche are we serving or what one do we want to serve? And a lot of times, this would be my recommendation, is it's going to be something that you are either interested in or something that you have a passion around. And I know a lot of people say, well, like, oh, I don't care about that stuff. Other people say, just sell the stuff, you know, sell products that are selling or, you know, offer products that are selling. Go there. We can do that. But don't you want to enjoy what you're doing? Don't you want to be excited about what you're doing? Like I do. So any time that I've went outside of that, it doesn't get me as excited as it does for something that I'm totally interested in, right? Or something that I just 
love talking about or something that I love doing research on or something that I love. Like right now, I haven't really published a lot of content here on YouTube about what we're doing on YouTube. I'm not going to be a YouTube expert. I'm not saying that I'm a YouTube expert, expert, but I am learning a lot. And that's how I've always learned anything, right? I'll learn and then I'll do, I'll learn and then I'll do. But the very first thing that you need to ask yourself is, is like, what am I passionate about or what do I have an interest in? Okay. And then we can start to do the validation piece. Okay. And the validation piece right now, and this is what I told my buddy. I said, Hey, now what you need to do is go to YouTube. I'm going to start on YouTube because that's where I'm going to start to get my traffic. Okay. And I'm going to start building subscribers and I'm going to be able to potentially monetize there. But what I need to do is I need to validate that there's been other people posting in this niche. So I know that there's traffic there, right? I don't want to post in a very, very micro sub, sub, sub niche that no one's searching for that might get like 500 views is like the top video. Like, I don't want to do that. I want to know that there's a demand for the traffic. Just like we talk about Etsy. We want, before we launch an Etsy product, we don't want to just say, Hey, that's a great product, but let's just launch it. We want to look at the numbers. We use a tool like Everbee and we look at the data and we, you know, don't guess, right? We want to know that there's demand there for that. In this case, we're looking at, is there demand for this niche as far as content views? Okay. And so very first thing I, I told them to do was that I'm like, okay, we already know that you have a niche. Let's go validate it from there. Let's see if anyone else is creating content and they are, and there's some channels that have million, 2 million subscribers. Um, and the other thing I did learn too, by the way, a little side note is like subscribers on YouTube really don't matter as much as they used to. The only thing it does is it gets you over the, th if you get a thousand subscribers, then you are able to, once you hit 4,000 watch hours, you're able to then monetize. So that's like a limit that they put on there or a threshold that you have to hit in order to turn on monetization. So really right now for me, the only reason that you're getting subscribers or that you care about subscribers as far as getting them, I mean, you care about your subscribers, but you, you're just getting that first number to a thousand after that, can that help you when you post an, a new video? Yes, but not like people think people think, Oh, you got a hundred thousand subscribers. It's going to every, everyone that has subscribed is going to is get, is going to see that it's going to be notified about that. They don't, it's a small portion of those people. So when people are all hung up about like, well, I got to get to 10,000 subscribers. No, not really. You just have to put out content that people are going to want to click on and watch. All right. So I told my buddy, I said, that is our goal. Get you to a thousand subscribers and get 4,000 watch hours. Well, guess what? If he finds videos that are doing well and he can create his own version of those, again, you're not copying anybody because you can't, you're going to make your own version of a video that might do well, right? And then once you get the views, guess what happens? You get subscribers. And then once you get those subscribers, then we're going to lift that threshold that they gave us. And we're going to be able to start monetizing. So that was the very first thing I said, listen, his name is Dave. I go, listen, Dave, do your research, validate it, already validated it. Yes. Okay, cool. All right. That means we're going to, it's a, it's a go find your video topic. Go ahead, shoot the video, edit the video. I don't care if it's perfect or not. It doesn't have to be, it's not going to be and upload it and then give yourself a weekly number, a target that you're going to be able to hit every single week. And right now that's one video a week and then building that momentum. So that's like step one, phase one, whatever you want to call it, because once we do that and we get in a routine and we start uploading, we're going to start to see some traction. And then we can start thinking about monetization, which we'll talk about next. Chris, anything you want to say on that before I move on to the, the next piece? A few things really fast. So Scott, you said, choose your niche, right? If you already have something, right? You have an Etsy shop, you have an Amazon store, you have a blog, you've probably already defined your niche. If you haven't, then you need to go back and do that. If you're starting from scratch, then you need to go through something like what you and I have talked about in the past, Scott, the touch list, right? The, the deceptively easy strategy of just writing down everything that you touch for one, two, three days, everything that your wife touches, everything that your kids touch, everything that your uncle touches, whatever, until you start to see a pattern or something that you say, you know what? Every morning I love coffee. Is that something that I'm passionate about? 
every morning I go bass fishing. Is that something that I'm passionate about? And you can start to understand what your niche and what the ideal thing is for you is going to be. And this doesn't apply to YouTube. This applies to anything that you're trying to start as a side hustle. If you start with the niche in mind, it makes everything else a lot easier. The benefit of something like YouTube, Scott, is with very few exceptions, none literally that I can think of, every niche is already on YouTube. It's just a matter of how much it's there. And so that's another thing that's really interesting. There's a lot of niches that don't lend themselves to an Etsy shop right? Given the, the demographic and psychographics of the average Etsy customer, if you're a very male heavy niche, like bodybuilding, you know, all male bodybuilding, Arnold strongman competition type stuff, that's not going to do very well on Etsy, but it all exists on YouTube. It's just a matter of the scale and how much existing traffic there is. The other thing that's really interesting about YouTube, Scott, is people get really bogged down in trying to understand, you know, okay, uh, let's use Etsy for an example. Right. If I'm going to launch a new fishing store on Etsy, I want to know exactly how many sellers there are and exactly how much money they're making, because it's a limited pool when we're talking about something like a physical product. Someone has to choose to either buy Scott's bass fishing T-shirt or my bass fishing T-shirt. They're probably not going to buy both. And even if one or two of them do, not everybody is going to. As opposed to something like YouTube, where what you will find is that pie does not get smaller because the people that are interested in bass fishing, yes, they will have their favorite channels. But if YouTube makes a recommendation and says, Scott's got a really cool bass fishing trick that you're going to want to check out, just because someone else has shot a video about the same bass fishing trick does not mean that someone won't watch your video. In fact, it means they're more likely to watch your video because they want to make sure they didn't mess it up. And so the, the nice thing about seeing actual competition on YouTube is it gives you an idea of some baseline expectations of what is possible in terms of being able to generate traffic and all of those kinds of things. But it's also much more of an additive process in terms of what happens with the audience. People tend to go down rabbit holes, even if they've never seen your channel, subscribe to your channel, if they've watched content related to the things that you're putting out, YouTube goes, hey, Scott's channel and Chris's channel, they're pretty close. So if you watch his channel, you might also like this video. And when they've watched all of Scott's videos and YouTube starts showing a mine and they watch one or two of mine, then they start showing them more of mine. And guess what? Scott's not posting 300 videos a day for people to watch. So whenever they run out of Scott's videos, they're going to watch mine. It's a very nice thing that you don't see in a lot of other ecosystems. Another example of this would be blogs, right? If, if you start with the question-based approach, which we're huge fans of on blogs, you either get that visitor, you don't. It's a very binary system. YouTube is much more additive. So that's just kind of my rant on that as far as competition and understanding those things go. Yeah. And, you know, before we move on to phase two or part two, step two, whatever, uh, I really want you to understand again, why I'm so like excited about this. And for us, like we've been kind of waiting for something organically to allow us to get in front of more people. Um, our, our, the podcast has done well over the years, right? And that isn't really a search kind of thing. It's a recommended type of thing, very similar to how YouTube is, is now. So if you think about it now differently, like if you ask yourself this, if you watch YouTube videos right now, they're generally ones that are recommended from things that you've shown interest in, right? If you go to YouTube right now and type in like how to barbecue something, you're going to start seeing barbecue videos and they won't be search-based titles. It'll be like, um, you know, uh, three, uh, three ways, uh, I cooked barbecue spare ribs on basic briquettes in my backyard or something like that, right? Like it's, it's going to be something that is related, but it's not necessarily a search optimized title. All right. And then once you watch a little bit of that, you're going to see another recommendation, maybe from that guy, maybe some, from some other guy or girl, and you're going to start seeing that stuff in your feed. Let's say that then you go in there and you look up something for your kids. Well, guess what? You're going to start to see recommendations about that. And so as you do this, you open up your phone as you're waiting in the car for your significant other. And you're like, oh, you know, I'm a little bored. Let me just go on YouTube real quick. And then all you're going to start scrolling and you're going to see what catches your eye. That is where we are, are right now in the day and age of YouTube. It's primarily being used like that versus the other. It used to be you would just go there and search. And that's what we were going after. Oh, like this one search gets 
1,500 searches a month. I'll go after that search term and hopefully I get some of that 1,500. Right now, it's literally unlimited. It really goes by the size of the audience, which is massive. So that's why I'm really, really excited about it because it does level the playing field and there is, they aren't going to hold our content back just because, you know, we haven't been out there being indexed for that search query. You know, if it's, if it makes sense, if it's a good thumbnail, which, you know, that's another huge thing. We won't talk about all of that because we could go here for like two hours on that, but so much has to do with thumbnail and title about getting click. And then once you get the click, then it's about retention. Again, we're not going to talk all about that, but that is what I would focus on is really audience building. That's what we're talking about is, is how to build the audience of people that are going to be recommended your videos, whether it's from you posting something and they get an alert because they are a subscriber or because they touched one of your other videos or touch someone else's video that's similar to your video. And that's really how the flywheel can start to happen. So lots of, lots of great stuff here. And I'm, again, you guys can tell I'm pretty excited about this. Um, all right, let's move on to now. What's the next thing, right? So a lot of people are like, okay, well, I want to make money. I want to make money with this thing. And as a side hustle, I look at doing that, posting a video is a side hustle because that's going to lead to your first dollar. And then from there, that is going to translate into many more dollars in the future. And then if you're doing it with this approach, thinking about it, like building something inside of a niche, okay, which a lot of people don't talk about. They're like, yeah, just go find random products that are selling or trendy products on Etsy and just sell a whole bunch of random products in your shop. I don't like that. Like, I don't advocate that. I don't tell people that, that, that that's what they should do. I think you should build in a niche. And obviously, shoulder niches, sub niches, whatever you want to call them, I'm a fan of that as well. But what we want to do now is we want to say, okay, what's our first way that we can make our first dollar with our side hustle? Okay. And here's what I would say number one, our first target is getting to a thousand subscribers on YouTube and 4,000 watch hours. Okay. If you have a, if you have a video that starts to really take off, that can happen very quickly. Um, our buddy, um, Adam, who we're helping, uh, actually I got a call with him tomorrow and, um, he's got a barbecue, just like I was saying, a barbecue brand, right. Or a channel. And, uh, I haven't looked, but he had his last video just hit like over 9,000 and he got a thousand subscribers in like three weeks. Now he's going for the watch hours. Now we need the watch hours to kick in, but literally like he can almost turn on monetization with ad revenue on, you know, on YouTube them allowing us to, to use that. So that's like the first thing. The second thing is though, is there's a lot of products that are being sold on Amazon in your niche. Well, guess what? All you need to do is recommend those products, talk about those products, drop them in your description, pin it to a comment in your comment thread on YouTube, and you're going to start getting clicks and you're going to start making sales. So that's the very first thing that I would do as far as monetization. And the third way is on Etsy, seeing if you can do print on demand or if you can do digital products. And then I would start to leverage Etsy. Okay. That's the order that I would do this right now. Now you could start it the other way. You can start on Etsy, but also if you are starting on Etsy, you want to make sure that you can do the YouTube thing maybe, or the audience building thing. You want to make sure that there's other products outside of the ones that you're going to sell that, that your niche is, is purchasing. You see, because we want to build this suite of revenue streams, not just, you know, on the one platform or on, you know, or in that one stream, as far as, like I said, like a print on demand products, or if it's digital products, like we want to have diversification amongst all of that. So those are the, like, to me, like 90 days, like that plan, it's pretty simple. Go into your niche and start publishing on a regular basis. and. I mean, regular, like once a week minimum, if you can do two videos, great. Start with one, get that down and then keep posting every single week, the same exact time. Okay. And then from there, try to hit that 1000 subscribers and your 4,000 watch hours. So we can turn on the monetization and that's where you'll make your first dollar. Right. In the meantime, also while you're doing that though, while you are 
creating these videos. If there's any products that you could be reviewing or that you could be mentioning or talking about, drop those into the description or in the pinned comment. All right. And then you'll, you're one click away from getting an affiliate sale from the Amazon associates program. All right. And then obviously while you're doing that, if you got time, go on over to Etsy, start doing your research, find those products in your niche, and then start creating those products that are going to be able to serve that, you know, that, that niche, because also once you start creating those products, guess what? You get to mention them in your videos too. Right. So that's what I would do there. Anything I missed there, Chris? No, I think, I think the big lesson there is with this model, if you're trying to turn a side hustle into a micro brand that can last over the long term, yeah. we're not just looking at one monetization model, right? We're not just looking at having an Etsy shop. We're not just looking at YouTube ads. We're not just looking at affiliate marketing. We're looking kind of at the order of operations here. And for some people, if you're getting started on YouTube, that monetization might happen on the very first video. It might happen three Good. months from now. So yeah. we don't want to be in that wait and see process. So how do we get around that? We take a look at the three lowest hanging fruit monetization options and start to plug those in. The first one that we have zero control over, right? Other than making sure that we're creating good video content is being able to place YouTube ads on videos. That will happen once you meet that threshold. As long as you're making YouTube friendly content and following their guidelines, that will happen. It's just a matter of when. The two that we do have more control over are the affiliate marketing. So is there anything related to the topics that I'm covering in my videos that I could link up in the description? Even a few clicks on the links in your description will start to lead to a little bit of money. Now, is that going to be $100,000 a year? Not up front, but is it going to get you that first dollar on the scoreboard like you were pointing out, Scott? Yeah. Even with just a few thousand views, it's not unrealistic for that to happen. Just given the numbers that we get of people who click and opt in for our free resources or even our paid resources, we know that that's possible. Even just with the views that we have on the Brand Creators channel, again, in a much more competitive space than a lot of the, the niche-based channels would be. The third thing would then be, okay, as long as I've taken a look at the content that I'm already creating and I've matched up some affiliate offers that, that work for that, then does my niche exist on Etsy or somewhere outside that is a marketplace? Etsy, Amazon, something like that. And how do I serve them products to keep this going? Because once we have that traffic, you get a nice flywheel back and forth of, you get a lot of views on a YouTube video, you link it over to your Etsy store, your Amazon store, wherever you're selling those products, your own website, they come over, they buy stuff. People buy stuff, then they go, hey, they have a YouTube channel. And they, they come, and if they're interested in your niche where they found you on Etsy, Amazon, your own website, they come over and they start watching your YouTube content. And you're able to monetize on both sides of that. So it's not about choosing one monetization method. It's about looking at the options that are available. Those are the three pieces of lowest hanging fruit that are available for pretty much anybody. And you can start to make even just a few dollars with only a handful of, of views coming in. Is there anything that I'm missing there? No, no. I, again, I think a lot of times people overcomplicate it. They also think like, okay, side hustle means I'm going to go and, uh, you know, start this thing today. And then tomorrow I'm going to start making money. Well, this, that, that type of side hustle would be go drive for Uber, right? Like if you go drive for Uber, you're going to basically sign up, go through all of the process to get approved your car background checks, all that stuff. And then you're going to have a notification come up on your phone and go, you got to pick someone up, you pick them up, you drive them to the airport, wherever, and you get paid. Like that's what a lot of people think of a side hustle. That is not going to be something that you're building long-term, right? It's something that you have to show up. You have to do the task, the job and get paid. Nothing wrong with that. Okay. But it's not scalable. And it's also something that you're not building that could build into something really, really, uh, you know, life-changing. Right. And a lot of people, they're like, well, I, I want to hit $70,000 a year. I want to hit $100,000 a year. What we just went over is very doable for most niches following that approach because everything comes down to, for me anyway, is audience. If you can build the audience, if you can build the attention, if you can get the views, the eyeballs in a specific niche, and then you either have recommendations for them, right? If you were hanging out with a friend and you guys were always talking about, uh, I don't know, mowing your lawn and you guys were talking about like the new ego electric mower and all this stuff. And you convinced your friend that it's a great product. They're going to probably go to the store and buy that same model, that same brand, that everything, because they were recommended. It's the same thing. When you're building an audience, you're building no like and trust. And then people buy through you, even though they know that 
they're going to give you a commission they want to in a sense, right? You're not paying anymore. So that's the great thing about the audience build. And it does take time. It does take time. But after you build it, it's an asset that you have now, right? The other thing I didn't mention, Chris, was, and people are probably also wondering like, well, what about a website, right? I didn't put the website until the very kind of end in this process, because I think like the website is something that you do want to have eventually, but it's not something that I would focus on in the very beginning, because all we're doing in the beginning is focusing on getting the attention and building that audience on YouTube. So this way here, we can direct that traffic to wherever we want. We can direct it to our Etsy shop. We can direct it to our website. We can, uh, we can drive it over to our email opt-in for something that we're going to give them in exchange for their email, which we would be doing, right? So all of those things, those are all byproducts of the audience and getting the attention. And that's why we're starting there and building up that momentum. And it's crazy now that we've kind of dove headfirst into this YouTube universe once again, uh, it's mind blowing on some of the channels that are just crushing. And I'm talking doing like hundred thousand dollar months on just ad revenue. Crazy. Now, not all niches are going to do that, but it is very realistic to make a thousand, two thousand dollars a month on just ad revenue from YouTube being a partner with them in the in the uh, YouTube partner program, like very very uh, easy. I don't want to say easy. It's very attainable, right? It's totally attainable for most niches to get to that number. All right, and then from there, once you get the views, everything else just kind of takes takes control, right? It, it's like then you have the affiliate offers. That starts to bring in revenue. Then you're going to have people reaching out to you and going like, hey, I noticed that you're in the lawn mowing niche and you just show different ways to, to line your lawn or cut your lawn, which by the way, that is a channel out there. There's a, a striping, like uh, mowing, striping certain mower that people are using for their lawns that they use on like ball fields and stuff like that. It's a, it's a thing. These mowers are like three grand, right? And so, you know, that right there is is something that you can do by just again serving that market and then people are going to want to buy through your link so you got that and then you're going to get potential brand deals and they don't have to be big brand deals they could be like oh someone's like oh i noticed that you that you're talking about mowing lawns right like how to mow a, a lawn and stripe a lawn we sell those mowers would you post about our or mention uh, our, our mowers, do a 30 second spot, a 60 second spot, and we'll pay you $2,000, $1,000, $500, depending on how big your channel is. Okay. <laughs> You're going to do it anyway. You would do it if you didn't get paid, right? Those are the things that can start to happen down the, down the road. So that's what we're most excited about is just, we have seen so much growth in a short period of time uh, since we started doubling down on this. Uh, and it's, it's just, it seems like it's just ticking up now. Does that mean that you don't have dips? Yes, you do. You know, it, it you are going to have times when, you know, you, you get traffic and then the traffic starts to dip and then the traffic starts to come back and then you'll get a video that you did three months ago that starts to take now, right? That stuff can happen. So to me, you're building an asset and, uh, and it's, it's a, a video view that can, that can be done now, you can get it now and you can get it a year from now, five years from now, um, which is really, really cool. So. That's why I'm most excited about it. One quick question here, Chris, before we, uh, before we, uh, get going here on whatever else we're going to talk about. Uh, <laughs> but, um, I'm curious if you guys are here live or even on the replay, uh, I am curious right now is how many of you, uh, are considering starting a YouTube channel, just drop it in there. And then the other thing is we got a little bit of time here. Give us a niche or your niche and let's spitball a little bit on what you could do within that niche. I think that would be kind of fun. Um, Chris, did you have any questions while we were 
spitballing. Yeah, let's here. let's just roll through this, uh, like the roadmap side of this, right? And the, the very first thing is just choosing your niche, like we talked about, choosing the monetization method, and then choosing essentially your schedule that you're going to do this. There's not a definitive thing that we can say, if you post once a week, you're going to get to 100K in the first year. That's not how this works. It's going to be very variable based on the niche. But once you start to see that monetization coming in, either through YouTube ads, through affiliate offers, or through sales on something like an Etsy store or a print-on-demand Shopify store that you built out, then you can start to do that math backwards and say, okay, for every 2,000 views that I make on YouTube, I make $18 in AdSense, I make $2 in affiliate commissions, and I make four sales on Etsy. Great. Now, how much money do you make on the sales on Etsy? All right, I make $5 on each of those sales. Okay. Uh, I think the other two added up to 20. So that'd be $30 per 2000 views across those different monetization methods. How many views do we have to get? And then is that achievable in the space? It's the same thing as looking at Etsy and, and starting with your number. So if you do that math, once you start to see even just the first few dollars coming in, it becomes very easy to understand your roadmap to 100K using that strategy. And Scott, uh, the first one that I'd like to talk about is the orange huntress comment and said, I do wild game cooking videos and have an apron that I made coming for me to wear. I'm so excited while I cook. Right. So to me, wild game, right. Uh, we, and we, we actually talked about this a little bit last week. Go look at somebody like Google foods, uh, who is not just, they started off as like the everything grilling channel, but they have a whole series that they've done on weird, wacky foods, right? Not that wild game is weird or wacky, but they did like mystery meat videos, right? There's a whole bunch of things all around that. The other place that I would be looking for inspiration there comes right out of the Orange Huntress's name would be outdoor living, uh, hunting, backpacking, some of those types of, of channels just to see what's working really well for them and see if we can tie that back into a cooking theme or a, you know an eating wild type of a theme and bring that back into the channel dream talking with Vicky said, I, I really like this because it's doable and scalable. She said, I have a dream. I have a channel in the lucid dreaming niche. Mm -hmm. And so I, I love that niche as well. And Scott, I don't know. Are you familiar with the concept of lucid dreaming? I am not. So the, the concept of lucid dreaming is that you are dreaming while you're asleep, but you are aware that you are dreaming. And so you are then therefore able to control what happens in the dream. So instead of just having that one dream over and over again, where you're falling, you can turn yourself into Superman and fly around the city. Right. That's kind of one of the, the cool things about lucid dreaming. You've, you've probably done it once or twice in your life unintentionally where you're like, this doesn't seem real. And you start to think about something and then it happens yeah, while yeah, you're yeah. asleep. That's lucid dreaming. But okay. there, there are some things that you can do. And I'm sure dream talking with Vicky can can help us out with this. There are some things that you can do to alert yourself to the fact that you are dreaming while you're in a dream. Right. Certain sounds, certain smells, some of those kinds of things can serve as a trigger to you while you're asleep. The, a very closely related niche to that would be something like meditations or sleep meditations, right? So I would take a look at what's working really well for them. Uh, there's a lot of meditation channels that do meditations for sleep that are eight hours long. I'm not mm -hmm. suggesting you do eight hour long videos, but that's a great way to make a lot of money with a, only a handful of views if you're able to monetize that the whole way through. So I like that one as well. Uh, and then Giselle said, I definitely plan to have a YouTube channel. So yeah. Uh, Okay, so we got another one from from Nad, South Asian cooking. Yeah, so at any of these, like the way it used to be, and I'm not saying that you wouldn't shoot videos like this, is like how to how to make you know fill in the blank you know Asian cooking or whatever, right? Like you would you would fill in a recipe, right? Like people are gonna search for that, people are gonna probably find that interesting, but a different angle. And this is where people aren't thinking along these lines. It's like maybe you sample five frozen Asian meals, right? And you're like, I tried, you know, whatever. Um, we have a Harris Teeter around here. That's our grocery store. Like, you know, five Harris Teeter uh, frozen Asian dinners. Or I tried five frozen Asian dinners from Harris Teeter, right? That's it, right? And then people that are interested in that, they're gonna be like, I wanna kind of see what that it's like. And were they good? Were they bad? I don't know, right? So that's a way that you can start to tap into other popular topics or, or areas or even cooking channels, right? Like maybe someone did a cooking recipe on, I don't know, um, one of the famous uh, 
I, don't, I can't think off the top of my head, Chris. You probably know. Maybe uh, that uh, is it. Ramsey guy there, the guy that's like loud and obnoxious. Dave Ramsey, um, or, Dave Ramsey, Gordon Ramsey. Yeah, yeah. Gordon, <laughs> Gordon Ramsey. Like maybe he did one on like Asian cooking, and then you do a reaction video to what he did or or something that he said, and and something like that. Like that would be cool. So there's a lot that can be done other than just like how to cook Asian food, right? Like it. There's way more to it than that. And honestly, the recipe content is the least interesting side of food. And if you look yeah. at recipe channels versus food channels, which is the same niche, it's just a, yeah. a mindset shift, recipe channels, things that are dominated by, here's how to make this, put this in, put this in, put this in, get way fewer views than food channels. And Scott, I think the best example of this, and I don't know if you're familiar with this channel at all, is Sorted Food. They are a group of friends yeah. out of the UK. Uh they started the channel a while back and two of them were professional chefs and the other three that are part of the channel are just normal people. Now, now they have five years of professional cooking experience, right? But right. that's kind of their, their shtick and they are making recipes, but they do it in a different way where the, the video is not about the recipe, right? You can go to their app or their website to get the recipe. It's about the process. It's about what they're doing. So they do, uh, they do a great thing where they have that, you know, just the normal guys guess the spice blends. So they'll say, all right, you know, here's a spice blend from Laos, uh, you know, what's in it, or here's the spice blend, tell us what's in it and then guess where it's from. And they get points and they go through all of that. Um, the, the best cooking channel. And I, I can't think of the name of the channel I'm blanking right now, but the best one that I've found that is a purely recipe channel is not a recipe. It's not original recipes. It's a guy that's cooking Julia Child's recipes as a normal human being. So he bought Julia Child's cookbook and he is attempting to make Julia Child's French cooking recipes that take 10, 15 hours. And if you screw up one thing, everything <laughs> falls apart, right? He's attempting to make those as a human being, not as a professional chef, just to document that process. So it's not about the recipe. It's about the process. Mm -hmm. And with food, it's really about the process or the story behind it. And if you look at the channels that are doing really well, they're much more Anthony Bourdain, much less Gordon Ramsay, mm -hmm. right? Much less Rachel Ray, because right. if they want the recipe, they're just going to Google the recipe. If they want to see the process, they want to see what's going on. They want to be entertained. That's when they're going to a food related, something like sorted or one of those types of channels. Yeah. 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 No, I, I mean, there's a lot of opportunity there. Um, even like I said, like the wild game cooking, like it's different, right? It's not just cooking. It's like, it's in that space. And I mean, man, there's so much that you could do within that channel. Um, entertainment cooking. Yeah. Love it. Yeah. It's, it's great. Definitely. Let with, us know. Like with something know, like, like wild or the, the orange huntress, right? Like using more primitive cooking methods with the wild game kind of gets you there, right? Yeah, Versus yeah. just doing that. It could be cooking outdoors. There's another great one. Um, there's two actually, it's like Sam Miller, I think, or Mac, Mac Miller, it's like the history of food. And he goes and he finds like an ancient Roman bread recipe and then tells the story of, you know, where this came from in Rome and then makes it, it's not about the recipe. It's about the story. Mm -hmm. Right. And so that kind of works across everything. The other one is a guy, uh, and again, I forget the name of this just because I've seen it so many times. He pops up every once in a while in my recommendations that wears like colonial garb and does colonial cooking, right? He right. built like a colonial cottage in his backyard right. for the YouTube channel. Obviously he recorded that as part of the process yeah. and he's recording, you know, what did they eat during the American revolution and recording those as recipes, explaining the That's difference brilliant. in, you know, this spice doesn't mean this in this time period. So if you mm -hmm. make it this way, it's going to be very different, right? Mace doesn't mean this. It, mean, it means that cilantro didn't mean this. It means that. And so, it's kind of interesting, but again, it's not about the recipe. It's about the story behind it or the process in it. The other one that I've seen popping up a lot recently are the kind of like Mr. Beastified cooking channels. So there's a great one for anybody looking at like the Asian, South Asian type cooking. Um, they do like cooking for the entire village. <laughs> so they'll make, you know, a, a classic South Asian dish, but for 400 people. So again, it's not about the recipe. It's about, can they do it? for 400 people. And how do you take a recipe that's designed for four people and make it for 400 and still have it taste good? You can only make the wok so big before it gets out of hand, right? And so they start to go through that process to figure out how they can scale this up and make it for 400 people. So, so if that's the question thing, is this, Chris, and I know this is what people are thinking like, okay, that sounds great now, but how do you make money from that? Right? Like you, you do that video, right? Like you do the video and you're like, cool, I made a video. 
how do I get paid from that video? Well, and that, that comes back to the monetization methods. And if we use somebody like Sorted Food as an example, Scott, they have the YouTube ads, obviously. They do sponsored videos from time to time. Uh, they just did one on one of the like all-in-one cooking device type of things. And they give their honest feedback on it, whether they like it or not. And then they have the Sorted app, which is where they keep all of their recipes. And it's a paid subscription that you can do that with. Oh, and they also have affiliate deals and they have merch and they have all of those kinds of things. So it's just a question of figuring out what your niche is and then choosing those monetization methods. And like we said, there's the three basic ones that we talked about, which are YouTube ads, affiliates, and then some sort of merch opportunity, right? Something that they can go buy that's a physical product. But once you start to scale this, you come into a bunch of other opportunities like the sponsored content and some of those kinds of things. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, the Orange Huntress uh, asked too, should I reach out to places for sponsorships or should I wait until they find me? Well, again, it depends how much, how many views and stuff you're getting. Like I would say I would probably wait until I'm getting like a thousand views per video minimum. Um, it just, show, I mean, then people can go like, okay, I'm going to get in front of a thousand people potentially. Um, and I don't know how many views you're getting, but I would probably strive to get there first. And then, yes, I would reach out to ones that are, uh, potential sponsors, you know, and then, you know, and, and again, only reach out to sponsorships that you genuinely want to be a part of, right? Like that you genuinely want to talk about. Uh, I mean, right here on the brand creators channel, I've had, uh, people reach out to me and I say, you know, I'm sorry, it's just not a good fit. I don't, you know, I, I can't, I can't see myself even creating a video about this, or I can't see myself talking about it if I'm not using it or had experience with it. So it's not just about getting a sponsorship, it's about getting the right ones. And if you're creating that type of content, they will usually come to you. You'll, you'll start to get people reaching out to you because you're now being noticed in this space. Um, and it, and it will happen. Um, but yeah, I, I I'm with you, Chris. I mean, the very first thing is, is like, once this starts to happen, like if you shot a video, a reaction video on someone else, that's doing this, a cooking show about how to cook something. And then you're giving your two cents about it. You're like, yeah, I've done that let, that way, but that generally makes it too spicy. So what I generally do is I do this, I do that. And that just makes it a little bit easier. Um, at least for me and my guests have always liked it, but yeah, I like that tip. Right. And then you, you watch a little bit more and then you add another thing. Like you can literally do that with almost any industry and it's pretty simple to do, or you can create three dishes, um, in, in various ways. And then you're going to give the pros and cons, or you're going to give like alternate ways, or here's a great one too. This just kind of came to me how to create like this high end dish, like buying ingredients from the dollar store or something, right? Like buying your spices from the dollar store. Like that would be a great video to watch, right? Our buddy, Josh Weissman just did that. Uh, he's one of the, the bigger YouTube chef type people. Yeah. I think it, I, I swear, I just watched it last week yeah. and he went, I think it was into the dollar general and it was, you know, can you make a gourmet meal from the dollar tree or there something you go. like that? And the answer right. is, yeah. Is it right. going to taste as good? Maybe, uh, yeah. but you know, you can, you can do all of those kinds of things, but right. And, and so from that, you're building up the views and from those views, you're going to get paid from YouTube, right? YouTube ads. That's like first thing. Second thing is, is yes, even though you're using spices that are from the dollar store or whatever, you probably use certain pans and you talk about those certain pans and guess what? You're going to probably link them up in your description. Uh, and that's an affiliate link, right? So in whatever other products that you use, you're going to be linking them up and you will start to get affiliate stuff from that. You might have your own products. You might have an apron. You might have, you know, uh, maybe utensils, maybe your knife set, like whatever it is, like you're going to probably eventually have that stuff. Um, and all of that stuff is where you'll be starting to add these, um, these additional revenue streams, sponsorships, like all of that stuff, but it comes from getting the attention and building the audience. And to me right now, today, 2023, the best way that I feel to do that is not through paid ads is through using YouTube because it's a great way to build an audience and get paid for it. Chris, do you realize we haven't spent money on ads, Facebook ads for brand creators in over nine months, but YouTube is paying us every single month to basically create videos. 
It's pretty crazy. Which which then lead people to opt into the email list, which then lead people to opt into the things that we have to yeah. sell to give them more information, which is us getting paid to generate traffic. And somebody said, you know, I love the idea. I got to find it. It was one of the first comments that came in. Um, they said something something along the lines of free traffic is great, especially if it engages and converts. And I, I replied, even better if you can get paid for it along the way, right? Like that's really what this is about at the end of the day. It's about making the most money in the least amount of time if this is what you're trying to do you're trying to turn a side hustle into a six figure plus brand we have to think more intelligently than okay i'm going to invest all of my profits back into ads if we can create a flywheel that pays us to create the flywheel that's the best way of going about this and building a blog is a great way to do this as well we can turn on ads and we can get monetized that way it yep. just tends to happen a lot faster on the youtube side of things because it's not dependent on the search base it's dependent mm -hmm. on the recommendation engine. So as long as you're making content, people in your niche would be mildly interested in, YouTube is going to give you that chance. And Scott, we had a couple of questions that I wanted to address before we jump off here. Yep. Um, Dr. Angie said, I've heard that shorts are a great way to get good traction. Is that true? Shorts are a good way to get a lot of views, but they don't necessarily turn into long-term subscribers and they're not a great way to start to build the traction in terms of the flywheel that we are talking about. Yet, YouTube has finally rolled out some monetization to shorts that is okay. It's nowhere near what you would get on long-form videos. Traction and depends. at least right now, people who watch the short-term content or short short-form content don't mm -hmm. tend to convert into long form content people. They stay in that short term content niche. So I wouldn't focus my strategy around shorts. I would focus my strategy around creating, and I'm not even gonna call it long form. This would be long form, right? We've been talking for an hour already, but 10, 15 minute videos, that that is still the bread and butter of YouTube. And even people who watch, watch short content on TikTok come to YouTube to watch longer form videos. There's a reason Twitter is trying to become a YouTube competitor. And if you guys haven't noticed, one of the things that you can do on Twitter Blue, hey, Twitter, we're actually live streaming on Twitter right now, in case you guys didn't know. Uh, if you have Twitter Blue, you can upload longer form content. Part of the reason behind that is because they want to create an ad network competitor to YouTube and AdSense, which is how yep. you get monetized on YouTube because they know people don't just watch 20, 30, 60 second long videos. They watch longer form content and they know that advertisers will pay more to be in that longer form content than they will to be in front of a 30 second reel that is going to be immediately forgotten. So there's nothing wrong with shorts. I'm not against shorts, but that's not where I would put the vast majority of my time, energy and effort. I just got one thing to say about it. If you have the choice because you have a limited amount of time, you're going to get more bang for your buck we're creating a video that is 10 minutes, 12 minutes, 15 minutes, somewhere in that range than you are for posting something that's 30 seconds or a minute long, trying to jump in on the shorts feed. Um, and I would say the, I mean, we're not even doing shorts right now. Like we've dabbled with them, like they're on our channel, but we kind of started and stopped, started and stopped because I said, I would rather post my two videos. So I post, uh, let's see, Tuesday and Friday here on the channel. And then Wednesday we do a live. So technically we're posting three times. Um, now, sometimes I will take a little clip from the live and I will repost that an edited version of it because sometimes people don't want to sit through the live. They just want that one nugget. So we've done that. It's been okay, but nothing beats creating a dedicated video. It also, like Chris said, is going to get that person that is going to invest 10 minutes into watching something of you, it's going to buy into your brand and into you, right? You know, the no like, and trust. So right now it's not my focus. If we get everything else kind of dialed in and I want to start playing with the shorts, maybe, but I am not going to go down that road right now because I don't want, I don't think that the ROI is there for that yet. Um, personally. And if I have time, extra time, I'm going to do another video, right. And put it up on the channel. What else we got, Chris? Uh, so the, the other one that I wanted to address, Scott, and if you guys have any other quick questions, drop them in while we're on, was from NAD. Uh, how important is uploading at a set time every week in comparison to uploading on different days and different times? There's nothing wrong with doing a little bit of, an, of experimentation because what you will find over time is just because you say Tuesday at nine o'clock is when you're going to post, that's not necessarily the best time for you to post in your niche. But you can't know that 
until you start posting videos consistently. So you need to just pick a day and time or days and times in which you are going to post. And then the data, and this is one thing, Scott, that I absolutely love about YouTube. You in the past have called me an analytics nerd, an analytics ninja, a magician. Geek. Something. I think I threw geek, geek in there. Uh, yeah. Probably a dweeb, a dork, whatever. I don't care. I like analytics because they help me make informed decisions. I do too, though. I love it. There is almost no other platform that gives you the every single piece of information that you would need to make every piece of content you make better. Even Google Analytics doesn't give you the in-depth understanding of what you get inside of something like YouTube. YouTube shares almost every possible piece of information with you about the video in a fairly easy to understand way, including the exact times and number of views that people are watching the video. So what you might find is you start posting Tuesday at 9 a.m., but you get your most views Thursday at 11. So maybe we move from Tuesday at 9 a.m. to Thursday at 9 a.m. so that we get more velocity behind that video and then we'll test that. But we still wanna try posting consistently. We don't wanna be all over the place. And the reason for that is, even though subscribers don't make up a big portion of YouTube traffic in general, and notifications don't always go out to everybody, um, it is nice to get that initial boost with what you have inside of your audience. And if they know to expect a video at Friday at 1030 or Tuesday at 1030, then they're more likely to click on that notification when it comes through and it gives you that initial push of velocity. Now, when we start looking at the numbers, we may change that, but when we change it, we're gonna change it and leave it so that it's consistently in that place and they can start to create that expectation again. So that would be uh, my piece of advice, post consistently. And then if the data tells you differently, move when you're posting consistently to where the data tells you to post consistently rather than yeah. just putting it up when you get it done. And I know you had a conversation with your buddy Dave last week about the importance of consistency. Yeah. My only thing I'm going to say on this, Chris, I mean, you covered it perfectly. The biggest thing that I'm going to say on this is in the only reason why I'm saying post it on the same day at the same time. And, and I don't care. You can draw out of a hat when you want that to be. And really my conversation with him was when can you guarantee that you're going to be able to post a video every single week. I don't care what time it's at because right now your channel's brand spanking new. Now, if I was to choose, if I was to advise you, I would say, try it in the morning, try it at like between nine and 11, just try it. Right. But that's where I would start. That would be my starting point, but give me the day, give me the time. And then I need you to lock in and commit to that for the next 90 days. And that would be it, right? So that's my only thing about like when and how important is it? The most important thing is, is that you get a video live, right? And then you do that consistently, right? That's it. Like you can't work out three days a week this week and then next week work out one day and then take another week off, then come back and work out three days. You're just not going to get the results. You got to be consistent. It's the same thing with this. So that, that would be my only thing. I have, I have three words to wrap that up. Consistency consistency, consistency, right? <laughs> that's, that's all that you need to know. It doesn't really matter when that time is you'll figure yeah. that out from the data, but if you can be consistent, that's going to be the key for everything. Two more things really fast, Scott. Uh, Giselle said, I came in late. I, can you talk a little bit about how to monetize a music YouTube channel? I'm thinking it's more of a playlist. So posting other people's content, which is kind of what I'm thinking you're talking about doing there is a gray area, right? There's a lot of music channels. If you just search like country music, uh, you'll see that they put together, you know, the Billboard Top 100 as one long video. Can they run ads on it? Yeah. Is that what you should be doing? Probably not. What I would rather see you doing is creating React content or, Scott, you and I were talking about this last week. I don't know if we were just talking about it on Fox or if we were talking about it on the live. And it was like a father and daughter, right? So essentially you and your youngest daughter, you playing her your hair metal and her reacting to it and then her playing you Taylor Swift and you going, man, that sounds a lot like... right whatever, you know, it's, yep. it's very inspired by ACDC and just watching her melt down. Right. right. So more of the music analysis or some of those kinds of things like the react type of stuff is what I'd rather see you do rather than posting other people's work. Cause that puts you into a copyright territory that you don't want to ever be involved in. The other question came from Jay, the mammoth entrepreneur. I'm not sure if that's referring to his size, to how big of an entrepreneur he is <laughs> or to mammoth California. Um, he said, what about an Etsy shop that sells home goods, kitchen decor? What ideas for a video would you have? So there's a lot of things, anything related to the kitchen or cook cooking niche would be fair game for you. So we could do knife related content or cooking utensil related content, or we could broaden that out into 
more of a cooking style channel, like what we were talking about, a food related channel that then features the design or features the, the things that you are selling as your own product, which you already yeah. happen to have versus waiting for a sponsor to come to you down the road and say, hey, you'll really like our Japanese steel knives. You have your own. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. All right. Awesome. Well, hey guys, this again was something that I wanted to share because I know it's outside of the, you know, the Etsy world or Amazon world or, you know, any of the stuff that we've talked about here on the channel in the past. But, you know, I've, I've asked, you know, do you guys want to hear more about like what we're doing on YouTube and, and all of that stuff? And I didn't want to, you know, not talk about it. So do me a favor. If you found value in this and you are watching this on YouTube, smash the like button, go ahead, smash it, crush it and, uh, and subscribe to the channel. That would be awesome. Uh, if you are listening to this on the podcast, if you could go on over to the reviews there and give us your biggest takeaway from today's episode, that would be awesome. Give us a little review there. And, uh, yeah. And the other thing is last thing before we wrap it up is Chris and I sent an email out the other day and we basically asked, should we basically talk about what we're doing here and should we maybe share it in a workshop type format where we get on for a weekend, maybe two, three hours, and you kind of hear our strategy about what we're doing, open up our dashboard, dig into our analytics, dig into our, our video strategy, how we're finding topics. And then also my buddy that I'm helping, I'm going to bring his channel into the mix because it's somewhat brand new. And, uh, and we're going to be kind of helping him through that and kind of keeping him accountable, but also, uh, planning out what those future videos will be, will be, and then be able to kind of sit in on that, like a fly on the wall, if you will. So we asked uh, in the email, would you want us to do this? And, uh, I think within like an hour, we had over 20 people that reached out and said, yes. So, um, we are going to probably do it. Don't know the date yet. If you want to, uh, be notified, or if you want to possibly attend that, um, just send me an email, scott at brandcreators.com and just put in there YouTube workshop, put that in the title and then I'll know, and I'll add your name to the list. This is, this is something that we're thinking about doing. We're probably going to do it. It's not going to be like a course or we're going to, cause we're not YouTube experts, but we are getting results and we are learning from just various sources and, uh, and we're putting it into play and we're, we're seeing some pretty good results. So if you're interested, definitely, uh, drop it in the comments or just go ahead and email me scott at brandcreators.com. They can also go to brandcreators.com forward slash YT. And that will take oh. them to a handy little form that I put together this morning just to make it easy for everybody to be able to do that. That way you don't even have to email us. You can, you and I can manually put you on that list or just go over to brandcreators.com forward slash YT and Didn't drop even your know email that. in there. Yeah. yeah. Look at you, Chris. Overachiever. All right. Awesome. Guys, that's going to wrap up this episode. As always, take care, take action, have an awesome, amazing day, and we will see you right back here on the next episode. Take care, guys.